In Greek mythology, Narcissus was a hunter from Thespiae in Boeotia who was known for his beauty. He was proud in that he disdained those who loved him. Nemesis noticed this behavior and attracted Narcissus to a pool. Narcissus saw his own reflection in the water and fell in love with it, not realizing it was just merely an image. Unable to leave the beauty of his reflection, Narcissus lost his will to live. He stared at his reflection until he was dead. Narcissus is the origin, as you might know, of the term narcissist. I share this with you because I once heard someone ask on a talkback radio, why do Christians believe in a God who wants us to praise him all the time? I mean, when you think about it, this is a a leading question. Um, It's a bit like about what we read in today's gospel when people worshipped the Lord before he ascended into heaven, though some hesitated. Um, There's great hesitation in this kind of question. It's a leading question, as I said. It implies that God is a narcissist who loves himself excessively, as if, you know, he wants us to praise him all the time, as if, you know, he, he wants to suck it all up just for himself. Nonetheless, there's some truth in where this person's question is headed, because God does indeed love himself, and God also praises himself all the time. In fact, God loves himself excessively. If you read Psalm 63 verse 3, you'll see that God loves himself more than life itself. God even wants to praise himself in and through you and I. So if it's not enough for him to praise himself, he wants to do it through you. So God is a narcissist then? No, definitely not. God is the absolute opposite of a narcissist. Before I explain, we need to ask, who is God? If God were one person, then he would definitely be, sad to say, a narcissist. But God is not one person. Rather, he is three persons, but one God indeed. After the, and, and the Father and the Son are constantly pouring themselves out, self-donating one another. They're also self-emptying themselves so that they can be receptive to the gift of one another. This mystery we see in the Blessed Trinity is beautifully expressed in Psalm 63, verse 3. Your love is better than life itself. This mystery is essentially what Jesus revealed in his, de- in his passion and death. The Son of God gave up his own life so that he could be receptive to the gift of his Father. What the Son did in his human nature, he has been doing for all eternity, namely self-emptying himself so that he, so that he can be filially receptive to his Father. The cross is a window into the eternal self-emptying also of the Father. Clearly, the Father becomes empty of self too, so that he can likewise receive the gift of his Son. For Jesus said, I tell you solemnly, whatever the, the Father does, the Son does too. Whatever the Father does, the Son does too. So when you see Jesus on the cross, what's the Father doing? St. John the Apostle reclined at the table of the Last Supper, leaning his head on Jesus' breast. Such contemplation of Jesus' sacred heart resulted in the most beautiful revelation. Specifically, St. John is aware that the Son abides in the Father in the most intimate communion of love. Explicitly, St. John says that the Son has for all eternity been hidden in the bosom of the Father. That's chapter 1, verse 18 of John's Gospel. Hidden for all of eternity in the bosom of the Father. 
What a beautiful and profound and intimate image. As for the Holy Spirit, He's the abiding fruit of the union between the Father and the Son. Now what about you and I? Why does God want to praise Himself through you and I? St. John of the Cross gives us insight into this mystery. He's a doctor of the church and a mystic who together with St. Teresa of Avila reformed the Carmelites. St. John of the Cross said that, quote, uh, said that God, quote, does not love things because of what they are in themselves. With God, to love the soul is to put her somehow in himself and make her his equal. Thus, he loves the soul within himself with himself, that is, with the very love by which he loves himself. This is why the soul merits the love of God in all her works, in so far as she does them in God. Now, St. John is not saying that God is, a na God is um, narcissistic in stating that he bears no love for anything lower than the love he has for himself. Because remember, God is a communion of persons. So when God the Son is praising his Father through you, you're graced with the gift of being in the Son, as the Son does so. This means you are taken up into the life of the Blessed Trinity. Thus you're graced with the opportunity to participate in the intimacy which takes place between the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. What's more, when we live a Christ-like life, God the Father can see and behold in us what he sees and beholds in his own dearly beloved Son. On top of this, the Holy Spirit takes delight in the, in the, uh, in the indwelling within us uh, because he is the infinite love between the Father and the Son. If you think what St. John of the Cross says sounds glum, where he explains that God does not love things because of what they are in themselves, then listen to what he goes on to say. Keep in mind that St. John of the Cross refers to the soul in feminine terms. The saints had no gender dysphoria. Rather, describing the soul as feminine is consistent with the, the church's tradition. For as Pope St. John the Paul said, in the church every human being, male and female, is the bride, in that he or she accepts the gift of the love of Christ the Redeemer and seeks to respond to it with the gift of his or her own person. This is what Saint John. The, so, knowing this, this is what Saint John the Cross uh, goes on to say. He says, "God gives grace for grace, because when God beholds the soul made attractive through grace, He is impelled to grant her more grace, because this grace exalts, honors, and beautifies her in His sight. God loves her ineffably." If prior to her being in grace, he loved her only on account of himself, now that she is in grace, he loves her not only on account of himself, but also on account of herself. And as he continues to honor and exalt her, he becomes continually more captivated by and enamored of her. St. Teresa of Avila, also a doctor of the church and mystic, writes about this too. She says, the soul of the just person, is, uh, she writes, is, is nothing else but a paradise where the Lord says he's, he finds his delight. I mean, we anticipate heaven to be our paradise, but the Lord considers his, parado his paradise to be the soul of the just person, that is, the soul united to him in grace. Surely, the Lord wishes this delight he experiences to be reciprocated, that we take pleasure in knowing that God dwells within us and we praise him for it. As you can see, God isn't a narcissist because he isn't egocentric. God isn't full of himself, so to speak. And thank God that we're, that we're vulnerable and even sinful because with enough humility and self-awareness, our weaknesses serve to empty us of our false self. God longs to dwell not in our false self, but in our true self, which is the image and likeness of His Son within us. And what's more, just as each person in the Blessed Trinity longs to dwell in one another, 
The Trinity longs to dwell in you and me. Now, God isn't a narcissist for another reason. I'm sure there's many reasons, but there's something significant here too. Let me explain it this way. Receiving attention is a fundamental human need. But a narcissist has an untamed drive for attention. Is this untamed drive for attention anywhere to be found in God? On the contrary, when Jesus revealed his Father and when he sent the Holy Spirit, we get the impression that each of the persons of the Holy Trinity were not clamoring for attention, but hiding behind one another. Yes, hiding. Why hiding? Well, to introduce each person of the Trinity better, and that we might pay more attention on the person who's being introduced. It's almost as if the Father hid himself for the sake of the Son who revealed him. And, it's almost, and it almost seems as if the Son is now hiding himself in heaven for the sake of the Holy Spirit, and that we might recognize what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. The Holy Spirit seems to hide himself too, for he does not manifest himself as a person who can be visually perceived. The Holy Spirit does this that you and I might come to know Christ and become more like him. Now the word hiding isn't a proper word to use here, for genuine humility doesn't disavow the truth. But we can make this point more clear by listening to our blessed Lord. You know, we don't disassociate uh, genuine humility doesn't disassoci dis disassociate oneself from the truth. So if you compliment someone and someone says, oh, no, 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 I'm not like that, you know, that's not humility. True humility is to say, oh, well, thank you. That's quite touching. Um, so perhaps the word hiding is the best word to use here. But nonetheless, there's something beautiful about this mystery. So let's listen to what our Lord says of this. In speaking about the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, he will not utter a message of his own, he will utter the message that, he has been, that, that has been given to him and that he will make plain to you what is to come. Notice how the Holy Spirit witnesses not to himself, but to the Son. And in John's Gospel, Jesus says that he doesn't bear witness to himself, but that, he, but, but that his Father bears witness to him. Specifically, Jesus said, For the works which the Father has granted me to accomplish these very works which I am doing, bear me witness that the Father has sent me. So Jesus witnesses not to himself, but to the Father. Satan, who is the quintessential narcissist, did not want Jesus to give witness to the Father. Rather, Satan wanted Jesus to draw attention to himself as the Son of God. Firstly, by throwing himself off the top of the steeple, unhurt, to gain the wonder, awe and acclaim of the peoples. And secondly, by coming down from the cross. Those who passed by hurled insults at Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, come down from the cross and save yourself. Both temptations were attempts to incite Jesus to grasp for his equality with God. What an interesting image that St. Paul speaks of. What does that remind you of in the book of Genesis? Did not grasp for his equality with God but emptied himself. So in other words, Jesus, uh, the, the temptation here was to incite Jesus to take advantage of his relationship with his Father for his own, for his own self-aggrandizement. But no, Jesus chose to remain empty of self, for only in vulnerability can there be intimacy. Essentially, without vulnerability, there can be no receptivity to the gift of the other. Narcissism, as with all other forms of pride and cognitive distortions, is an escape from vulnerability. Little wonder why vulnerability is so countercultural. We've all heard that God is omnipotent, and as you know, that's a Latin word which means all powerful. Now he is all powerful principally because he is un principally because he is omnivulnerabilis. That's a word I made up. Um, it means all vulnerable. <laughs> At least it's the two words conjuncted there to 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 to, 
bring about that sense. Because when you think about it, God is not just all-powerful. He is indeed all-vulnerable. Let me explain. I mean, God the Father's unimaginable power is not so much manifest in being able to do this or that as he chooses, but in the force of his self-surrender. This self-surrender is reciprocated by the Son. Is there any wonder that the same word in Greek, exousia, the same word in Greek for power, is the same word in Greek for vulnerable? Why does God's infinite capacity for self-surrender make God so powerful? I'll answer this question this way. When you want to overcome a strong man, first you must find his weakness and then target and exploit it. But this strategy does not apply to God. For God's weakness is his strength. Satan found out this paradox the hard way. What's a paradox? Well, we're celebrating one. God is three persons but one God. And another paradox is that his weakness is actually his strength. Vulnerability in God is the consequence of the infinite capacity the Father and the Son have to be, rece- have to be receptive to one another. You can't have vulnerability without receptivity. And you can't have receptivity without vulnerability. So too, you and I can find our greatest strength in vulnerability. Accordingly, God's power is found not in pride, but in humility. Not in riches, but in poverty. Not in honor, but in littleness and even in persecution. Not in strength, but in weakness. St. Paul tells us that God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise, the weak things of the world to shame the strong, and that God's power grows firm in our hidden self. Interesting how this image of something hidden is re-emerging. That God's power grows firm in our hidden self, for God's grace is underneath where we feel vulnerable. And we often, many of us don't discover that, 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 that gold, that wonderful treasure, because we have a natural aversion to what causes us vulnerable, so we just don't go there. Nevertheless, where our wound is redeemed, we are most gifted. Yes, your wound is the place where the Lord loves to dwell, for it makes us receptive to the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity. Your wound shouldn't be the object of your gaze so much as what the Lord is doing in it, namely dwelling within it. Consequently, we cannot help but be moved with profound joy. And be attentive to this joy for a moment. St. John of the Cross explains that in God we possess within ourselves more than what comes to us anew from anything or anyone else. And he's right, because God is greater. As a consequence of giving primacy to a relationship with God then, every time joyous and happy things are offered to you, whether they're exterior or interior and spiritual, you're reminded of the enjoyment you receive from the abundant riches you already have within you. And... Um, and, and experience much greater gladness and delight in them than in those new joys. In this way, you resemble God, who even though he has delight in all things, doesn't delight in them as much as he delights in himself. For God possesses within himself a good eminently above all others. This is the joy Jesus referred to when he said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. What's this joy Jesus experiences? The joy of being filially receptive to his Father. Not just to the Father's gifts, but the gift of his Father himself. Yes, in Jesus, we can be filled with God the Father. Consequently, we can say, in him we live and move and have our being. Jesus also experiences the joy of being received as a gift by his Father. 
For as we have seen, the Son of God has for all eternity been hidden in the bosom of the Father. On this point, has it ever occurred to you that in Jesus, God the Father sees and beholds you as a gift, a gift that redounds to his greater glory? 